My name is Douglas C. Welch, as he said. Thank you for having me out to speak to you today. Please forgive my voice. I contracted a cold from my son last night. Um, <laughs> so I have my coffee, <laughs> and we will make our way through the, our talk today. Uh, quick history about me. I come from a world of a theater degree in college, and I'm still involved in theater to this day. I discovered when I was in college I had an aptitude for technology, and so that's what I actually went into as my career. I worked in IT for a number of years, eventually going freelance. For the last 15 years, I've been a freelance computer consultant. And over the last three, well, two to three years, I'm actually in transition myself. I'm transitioning away from the under-the-desk work of plugging in routers and computers and all this other stuff and actually focusing more on something that I really, really love, which is new media, podcasting, YouTube channels, video, all this, all this crazy stuff in that new world that we've all entered in the last, eh, podcasting's been around for 10 years, I guess. Um, so that's where I'm headed. I often speak out to groups like this. Part of my career work comes from the fact that I've written a career column since 1997 called Career Opportunities. And that column uh, started out of some work I was doing when I was actually working in IT. I started writing for the uh, weekly tabloids that came out for all the IT workers, Network World and InfoWorld and PC Week and all those, which of course no longer exist. Uh, but I always wrote about careers from the standpoint of your career. It wasn't about resumes and interview skills and all this. It's about having your career and how to build the career that you deserve. So out of that column, I started to combine that with my other work and eventually ended up where I am today, which is presenting to groups like yours. I was actually uh, presented to open out in Simi Valley last week or the week before last, and that was my second presentation for them. Uh, I've actually given this talk to them, uh, and it was requested when I talked with Anthony he had heard about it, and he thought it was a, a unique talk to give to you. This talk is a combination of those two things, of my career knowledge and writing and my technological skill. First and foremost, we now carry around in our pockets today mm -hmm. something that has a million times more power than the computer which landed men on the moon back in oh, 1969. Okay? Wow. The computer in the LEM that... Uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin used was basically nothing more than a very, very crude programmable calculator. <laughs> Nowadays we've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Internet and I, we can do all these amazing things with our phones, but a lot of us don't use them as much as we should to really help build the career we deserve. Okay? There's a great partner that you have in your pocket if you decide to use it. Yes, we use it for phone calls. Yes, we use it for texting and voicemail. But today's smartphones go so far beyond those basic uh, uses that telephones have had in our life. In fact, I use my phone much more as a computer and a communications device than I ever use it as a telephone. Back when I was doing computer consulting full time, yes, I would be on the phone for hours sometimes all, helping a client remotely or something like that. Today, it's very rare I actually take a phone call on my phone. But I do use it for a lot of other things. Now, everything I'm going to show today, this is an iPhone 6, but nearly everything I show today also should be available for Android phones and in some cases even for Windows phones if you have one of those. If not, there are probably similar applications that you can find in the various stores for your phone. And even if you have a feature phone or one of those old phones like my wife carries, a lot of this stuff can still be done. It's not as easy. They have calendars, they have reminders, they have alarms, they have all these things, even in those little feature phones. And it may be a little more difficult, but I beg you, dig into your phone and find out what it'll do for you, because you'll find it'll do a lot of these things. The best thing about what I'm going to show you today is nearly everything, in fact, I think everything I'm going to show you today is a free app. Okay. Oh. I freely admit I am cheap. <laughs> okay. I don't like paying for something unless I'm really sure I'm going to get a value out of it. Uh, so all the apps I use today are pretty much free. There may be some advertising on the screens when you use them and stuff like that, but otherwise they're free for you to download and install on your phone. The great thing about using a mobile device like this or a, or a tablet is that you can be productive wherever you go. When I was consulting for full time, be it due to my Midwestern upbringing or my general nature, I'm always early, as you saw today. <laughs> Just the way I am. Back in the day before my smartphone, I couldn't really be that productive. I could bring something to read, I could make notes, I could write something in the car while I waited for my appointed time to be with that client. 
But oftentimes I was just kind of stuck, you know, doom, 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 not really being that productive. Once I got a smartphone, it was amazing. I could answer my email. I could communicate with people. I could take phone calls. I could research things. I could read books on my phone. I could do all these things while waiting for that appointment to occur. And my productivity skyrocketed. And I highly recommend that you do the same things. You can use these devices to work, to be productive in whatever form, no matter where you are. Two of the most important things about using smartphone technology and your career for me is being where you should be when you should be there. Okay? We all know in our personal lives we deal with people who just can't seem to be on time. Okay? <laughs> now, the fact is your smartphone can really help you with that. Now, of course, one of the things we deal with here in Los Angeles famously is traffic, right? Okay, so the first thing I want to show you how to do is how to get around this town in the most efficient way possible. And one of the apps I use is the one up there in the upper left-hand corner called Waze. Waze is my directional <laughs> app of choice. It provides so many great features to you. What's it called? Waze, W-A-Z-E. And you'll... Yes, it is available for Android and for Windows phones, actually. What Waze allows me to do is I can come in here and I'll actually say, navigate. Oh, look, GLA Pros meeting. That's in my calendar. So it immediately picked up in my calendar. I have an event with an address on it and actually puts it in my list. I also have various favorites, including my son's high school. I can say, take me to my son's high school. It's going to take me 35 minutes, 28 kilometers. Those little markers are traffic along the way. And I can then say, go. And it's going to navigate me around. Now, the great thing about this is this has voice control, just like things that are quickly being outmoded, the, the standalone GPS navigator in your car. Your phone can do all that for you these days, including voice prompts and everything else. I actually have a holder for my car that holds my phone in the proper position, which, by the way, is lower right or lower left. You're not supposed to have it in the center, according to the CHP, but it holds it right here. And I actually can tie it into my car stereo for a variety of reasons. So it'll actually give me my vocal instructions just like a GPS would. Yes, sir. Uh, does that uh, uh, intercommingle with Siri or anything like that? Uh, Waze does not, but I'm going to show you a way to use Siri in, uh, in just a moment. Okay. Uh, Waze has some rudimentary voice control, but basically it's designed to be used uh, with the touch. Oh. Um, so here we go. I can click on the upper, uh, the, the first turn there gives me the route. Which, by the way, please be more intelligent than your GPS. If it's telling you to drive off a bridge, please don't. Uh, I, always check, I always check the route it's given me to make sure that it makes sense to me. Sometimes it can actually be a bit confusing because it's actually routing me around live traffic. It has a link to traffic, and it can say, there is a closure up ahead. Get off at this off-ramp. Go up three exits on the side road and get back on, and you'll be fine, and you'll save 15 minutes. Okay. This Again, is Waze, right? this is Waze. Okay. Uh -huh. Having all that data inside of it allows it to be intelligent in routing for you. Now, other things that Waze can do for you, uh, one of the great things that I use it for nearly every day, you see the send ETA button. I can actually send a text to my son. It sends him a link to my map and shows him in real time where I am on my way to pick him up from school oh. or wherever it was. So that theoretically, in most cases, he can actually be waiting for me outside school when I get there. Oh. I don't have to pull up text yet again, say, hey, I'm here, come and find me. He already knows where I am. I use another app, uh, which we may get into later, it's a little more, more technical, that actually pings him. The minute I reach a radius around his school, it actually texts him a message, I'm in the area. So he can, he can also get that as well. Yes? Can you do this when you're on a bicycle or walking? This has, uh, yes, it does. It works totally for all those directions and stuff like that. Uh, it's the, Waze is predominantly designed for driving. It will work if you're walking or anything else. Uh, the other maps that I'm going to show you in a second actually have theoretically well-designed walking and transit maps as well built into them. Yes, sir? I didn't bring my aluminum foil hat, but I do have a concern about a lot of, 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 of things data overall. Professionally, I've seen how much a phone call here might be sucked into... The, the, the cloud, which then associates that so phone call with you or anybody else who has a similar sounding name and passes it on to NSA. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of being um, uh, joking a little bit about this, but in terms of sharing your location in real time, 
uh, the safeguards on a particular uh, uh, provider is crucial. Um, uh, what would you say in general and specifically about ways? I have made the decision in my life, and I deal with in another social media talk I give, I consider anything I put on the internet as public. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can fiddle with your Facebook settings all you want. If you understand them, you're better than I am, okay? So I consider anything I put out there public. So I have made my own personal decision to use these tools. That is up to each individual, how comfortable they feel with the stipulation, I think, which is most important, that anything you put on your phone, anything you send to someone else is potentially public. <laughs> now, the nice thing about the, the arrival times is when I share my ETA, it, after I reach that point, it expires. That link that I sent him will no longer work because, of course, I'm not no longer headed to his location. Right. So there's some things like that built in. But it is important that you each make the decision that is best for you. I tend to live my life out there. Uh, and theoretically, I've been have really had no issues with that at all. I write online, I post videos online, I do all this stuff, uh, and so in that case, that's my decision that I've made. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say um, that, that I think that's great, uh, but p- p- there are people like myself who've been subject to identity fraud, mm-hmm. so that's why I protect my information. I'm very careful about what I do. There are some people. If you if you are obviously if you are. If you have restraining orders against someone, you have something like that, that's a totally different world. And again, that is your personal decision. Like you may have to decide that you can't use some of these tools simply because you, you, they might put you at risk. Again, very personal decisions to be made there. Uh, one of the things you can also do with ways that I really like, uh, especially with the gas prices as crazy as they are, you may notice at the bottom there's a little gas button. It ties into gasbuddy.com and actually will show me, since it knows where I am, it says, here are the cheapest gas prices around you and where they are. Ooh. And if I wish, I can actually click on it, and it'll start to navigate me right to that gas station. Oh. Okay. Now, again, to come back to the traffic uh, integration, that, to me, is one of the most effective uses of Waze because traffic is simply an issue we must deal with here in Los Angeles. And it can prevent you from being on time if you are not careful. I will often an hour or so before I'm expected to be somewhere, if I'm at home, I will run my ways directions and say, what is the state of affairs right now? How long is it going to take me? This morning when I woke up, it said it's going to take 37 minutes to get here to this office today. Now, by the time I left, it was about 20, because I came down Van Owen. Um, but it's great to have that, in, that information in your hand. I will often use ways, even if I already know where I'm going, merely to give me the estimated time of arrival, the ETA. And the president is in town today, so that's really going to... Um, make this tool. Yeah, I, I actually, because my Perfect. son goes to Providence High School, we actually ran into Vice President Biden the other day. I, I had forgotten that he was going to be there, and we got tied up in that last time he was there. But yeah, today I have a listing of where the president is supposed to be hour by hour, and he's luckily only going to be in our area for a little bit, but it's great. To, that's information I actually got via Twitter. Okay. Okay. Probably um, some big buck person. Like no, huh? no, you have to, you don't have, you, you don't have nearly enough money. <laughs> So make sure you stick for your whole committee. <laughs> so, so that's my basic, that's my basic introduction to ways. I hope you try it. I hope you uh, spend some time with it. I think you'll find ways very, very useful. Now, someone asked about other mapping applications and how you might tie this into Surrey. <clears throat> now, Google, Android phones also have voice control in their own systems, which we'll yeah. demonstrate in a little bit. So, a lot of this stuff is going to work on you. Your phones, you may need to tell them in a different way, but it'll be very similar how it works. For example, I can say, Give me directions to Providence High School in Burbank. And our internet, our Cell coverage is a little slow today here, yeah. so we'll see if it will pick it up. Come on, work for me. Mm-hmm. Let's stop for a second. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now the interesting thing too is let's, we'll see if this works too. Because I have the phone plugged in, and this works, you have it plugged in in your car too, which I highly recommend. You should have a charger in your car so it's always charging. Hey Siri, give me directions to Providence High School in Burbank. Now notice I didn't have to touch it. Um, and that's one of the features you get in the car. If it's plugged in, you can actually talk to it. Are you going to be, you're, it's going to be problematical to me today. Yeah. Now, now what it, well, Siri does use the internet to, to do its uh, translation and stuff, and it could be that our internet connection isn't high enough. This is a dead spot. This yeah. is this room. Siri. Yeah. Is that Siri, S-E-R-I? S-I-R-I. That's the assistant that's built in. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward and show you that if I told Siri that, it would bring up Providence High School in Burbank. And... I could then say, 
you know, route me, and it would also now give me turn-by-turn -turn directions. I actually started using Waze and other things before Apple Maps and before Google Maps would actually give you verbal turn-by-turn -turn directions. It would give you printed directions on the screen, but it didn't have the voice. Now they have the voice. Now the other thing you can do too, notice the little red dots on the map there around the school. That's traffic. I can see in real time the basic traffic. Oh, that's actually us. Now. It's jumped over to us, right? Um, no, that's that's DeSoto. Yeah, that's DeSoto here. So, yeah, there's DeSoto. So th that's where we are right now. So it actually shows that there's traffic on DeSoto right now. You can use that. It will also try to intelligently en route you around traffic. I don't think it does quite a good a job as Waze does, but it does have some of those same features built in, and that app is built right into your phone. Now, this is the Apple Maps that Apple's decided to put on their phones. You can also download the Google Maps app if you like to, if you just prefer to use Google Maps, and it'll have all the same features. Yes? What, what is the name of this app? Is this just Siri? Apple Maps, Apple Maps. Is, is the map application. Siri is the voice recognition, which, of course, isn't working right now. <laughs> Let's try it again here. Give me directions to Providence High School. It may just take it a while, too. Okay, it's actually starting to work now. Getting directions to Providence High School. So imagine you were sitting in your car, and you simply said that. You said, hey, Siri, and you gave that command. This is what it would prevent, present. And then you can t reach up and hit the start button. Starting route to Providence High School. Head north on Independence Avenue, then turn right onto Van Owen Street. Now, what you're also seeing is a lot of this technology is being built into cars. There's a thing called... Oh, what's it called? Car Kit or something like that that Apple is, is, is promoting that a lot of the manufacturers are picking up and that actually ties your phone directly into your car display and will actually present a lot of this information right there and will talk to you through the speakers of the car. I've got the generation before that, so we can do, na I, you know, we spurt with navigation and it can be very entertaining because when you're driving, even your guest can't manipulate it, you know, uh, hand, hands on. So you have to hit the voice and then do letter at a time. Way cumbersome. Ways you need to pull over. Yeah. Ways will actually ask you if you're moving, are you a passenger? Mm -hmm. There's a button you can say, yes, I'm the passenger, I'm okay to do this. Yes, you should not be dealing with your phone. Uh, no. When you're uh, Google Calendar. Pardon me. One, Double two, tap voice over off. Thank you. Or even your onboard uh, navigation. That seem to stop yeah. most things it'll yeah. do. Rude and dangerous. So that's an example of using Siri to actually get your destination to an address. Yes, sir, ma'am. Siri, like three or four years ago, they had the advertisements. Mm -hmm. The advertisements went away. Is Siri still the only option, or are there more? Siri is the built-in option. It's actually part of the iPhone, and so it's been in the iPhone since iPhone four. And uh, it is, it is. They don't talk about it much anymore because now it's just part of the phone. So we've talked about getting where you need to be. Let's talk about a little bit about when you need to be there. <coughs> I am a small family. I have myself, my wife, and my son. Three calendars. Totally complicated trying to organize. When do I need to pick him up from school? He's not yet driving. When oh, yes, he has play rehearsal tonight. Oh, my wife teaches at four different colleges down in the Orange County area, oh and her schedule changes every semester. Oh my gosh, how do you keep a handle on it? The way I do it is with shared calendars. The calendar in your phone is amazing just for your own usage, but when you start to combine it with all the shared calendars that I have. So I have three calendars. I have more than three calendars in here. This is the Google Calendar that I use because I'm a kind of a Google person. I like using their services. Apple Calendar, the built-in calendar, also supports the same thing. Here is my schedule today. There you'll see uh, color coding. Very important for me. I like to be able to look at something at a glance and say, okay, I know the GLA Pros meeting is, is me. By the way, if I click on that, it'll show me the information. If I click on the address, it'll actually give me the directions to get here. So if you're going somewhere, it's great to have the the address in your calendar event, it will help you uh, integrate it with other things. Um, let me go back here. Well, on your calendar, you should always... If you're headed somewhere specific, yes, because then you can simply click on it to get back to, to where you... To, to let it navigate to, to where you want to be. Well, I've been yeah. experimenting lately. I've got a new computer with um, uh, um, uh, Office 2013, mm -hmm. which I got because I love Outlook. However... Um, if I searched my Outlook.com with the Outlook account, then I didn't have rich, uh, anything other than rich text yeah. for tasks and calendar items. Mm -hmm. So I've taken that away, and now I'm using Gmail on there. But They uh, just released uh, an Outlook app for the iPhone. 
Uh, what, what about, what I, about think for, I think for Android as well, that is getting great reviews. Mm -hmm. I have not used it in a while, but it, it has actually just come out, and it's gotten some really good views, especially for integration between your existing Outlook accounts and that. Mm -hmm. So if you're an Outlook user, you may want to look into that. I, I've heard such great reviews that some people say you should use it instead of the built-in Apple calendar on the iPhone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that an email. It's that much better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a Google person, so I, I prefer that. Well, yeah, I'm, I try to figure out if I want to have the... Just use the Google. Uh, yeah. Uh, right now, I'm sitting everything in to, to re read all the other ones on. I ended up on Google. On my phone, which one I, I want to use? Because yeah. I was Google had the shared calendar services long before other people did, right. and so I started there and kind of built off of that. Mm -hmm. Purple things are my son's calendar. Green is my wife. So I know where she is. She's at Cal Poly right now, uh, teaching a class in their interdisciplinary general education classes. Uh, uh, my son has rehearsal tonight, and you see the ongoing days and so on. There's even Facebook events in there. You see the birthday that's in there. That's a friend's, an online oh, friend's birthday cool. from okay. a Facebook calendar. It's also integrated. Mm -hmm. If you, um, again, wanted to integrate Siri, you could say, Hey, Siri. Hey, Siri. Make an appointment for 3 p.m. tomorrow to talk to David over at GLA Pros. And again, typically it's faster, but we are dealing with the internet. Cell phone coverage here. Of course, it's going to be grumpy at me. What this would do, that normally that um, dictation, Siri might ask me a few questions as well. I might have to correct some typos, like GLA pros. It probably doesn't understand. I'm really sorry about this, yeah, it's, it's but I can't the, take any requests. It just, the, the connection to the cell isn't that good right here. Uh, it would actually add, ask me some questions and then add that to my calendar. So I could be walking down the street. I could be sitting on the bus. I tend to use my phone a lot when I take transit because it's just I can do a lot of work on the bus just going along unless I get on the subway, which that might actually be resolved soon if they start to add cell coverage to the subways. Um, but it would add that calendar event right to my calendar. Boom. I've captured that event right away. You can do the same thing for notes. I can say, make a note uh, to call... David, uh, and here are some topics we want to discuss and list off the topics. Then we simply dictate it into my phone. Okay. Again, information capture, whether it's an appointment or a note or a thought or a to-do item, is the number one important thing that you can do with your smartphone. It makes it easy to do. It gathers that data in a central location. You can access it here, or the great thing too is that also then you can access it from your computer at home, the computers here, wherever you might be on a larger device because the information gets shared. Yes, sir? When you're making the command to make an appointment to your calendar, mm -hmm. I, I've not been able to do that with uh, Google. When I uh, say, okay, Google, mm -hmm. make an appointment at 2 o'clock on Wednesday, it doesn't happen. Is there something you have to set it up so it will connect? I thought it was built in these days, but I'm not terribly familiar with the Android phones since I don't have one. Uh, I have some basic knowledge with them, but since I use the iPhone, I tend to be more expert in that. Um, I believe it should, though. Uh, it may just be the way you're stating it, or it could be level of the phone you have. Um, Android phones, of course, have the different operating systems, the ice cream sandwich, the Kit Kat. It, that may have been added at a certain point that maybe your phone is not at. Uh, that also can sometimes happen. You, you're not quite at that level. Like when I had an iPhone 3, I didn't have Siri. It wasn't until I got the 4 that I could actually, 4S, so I could upgrade to Siri and actually start using it. Um, so that could be something that's hitting you with that. Okay. So you, I, I beg you, please use your calendars. They are great ways of putting signposts in the road. You can set reminders to remind you days, hours, minutes before an event to make sure you're on time. Uh, if you're early like I am, it just reminds you, okay, I'm already in position. I'm good to go. Uh, but it, it, it does operate a lot as kind of a secondary brain. There's a book called Getting Things Done, which I highly recommend. Some people turn it into a religion, the GTD religion, but you don't have to go that far with it. But it's a, by a man named David Allen. And one of the great things about Getting Things Done that's always helped me, the feature that I use of that book the most, is the fact that he says you need to get everything out of your head. Mm -hmm. You need to get it into some system. That system can be on paper, it can be in your phone, it can be in a to-do list. Wherever is most comfortable for you, get it out of your head. Because your brain has this perverse idea of reminding you of things at the exact moment you can do nothing about it. 
And forgive the, the scatological nature of my, my de- example, but the time you rec- remember that you need toilet paper is when you are in the bathroom, okay? <laughs> Wrong time to be reminded of that thing. So uh, his concept is getting everything out into a system and freeing up your mind to then concentrate on those things that need to be concentrated on right now. That's a very intimate relationship with Siri in that case. Yes, very intimate relationship. <laughs> I'm not going to go into the, to the bathroom usage of, uh, of your smartphones, but yes? Can you access the um, Yahoo, your Yahoo calendar from... Yes, yes you can. You can access it via the web. There might also be various applications that can access your Yahoo calendar. For individual things like that, you'd have to research a little bit more. I couldn't say off the top of my head. Yes. Google will um, 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 absorb it too, if, if, for example, and vice versa. Yeah, you can you can move mail I around that way. I'm able to get the Yahoo calendar on my Android. You should be at least able to log in using the web browser, to log in via Chrome, as I, if you I were a computer. Log in to, uh, but, but I can't get to the calendar. There's hmm. a setting. Even on my, I, I've got a Samsung on the native calendar to here. I have um, my uh, Google Calendar and my Yahoo Calendar um, also pulled into here. So there's, there's the settings to think maybe, maybe my phone's over. <laughs> okay, everybody smile. Oh, everybody oh, smile. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, this is going to transition us over to the next most important thing about your phone. Your camera. Your camera is this amazing information gathering and collection device. I took a picture of the board in the back that has the email addresses on it when I was <laughs> listening to your, your meeting earlier today. Use that camera to its nth degree. You want to remember the store hours at your favorite store? Pop a picture of it. You want to remember someone? Pop a picture of them with their name tag on it. Even better. For someone like me who has trouble with names. <laughs> Um, you have a tree that you like or a plant in the garden that uh, someone a friend's garden that you like take a picture of it there is no reason not to use this great tool that you have built right into your phone and nowadays the quality of the cameras are amazing I actually use my cameras a lot for uh, kind of artistic shots like that and these I I share via my social media account this is a bahinia tree blossom that's a, a, a daisy, a Shasta daisy I took along my walk the other day. So you, you can make great use of your camera. And then uh, in just a little bit, I'll show you how you can even use other programs to literally make a file cabinet using your photos. It's not only searchable as a picture, but also searchable as text. I didn't realize how messy that actually looked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Does it look that bad? Now, now imagine you imagine you're filling out an application at a at a uh, interview site. Imagine you're filling out a W nine form for a job or a ten ninety nine whatever. Snap a picture of it so you know what you put down on that form. Make your own copy of it. Nowadays, I know guy site if we're site writing a new chart, he'll take a picture so that he can rehearse it at home. You're, and, and in that case, you're even seeing people these days who use iPads as their cheap as their uh, on the music as their fake book. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they that that is their 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 music. Uh, and there's even a <laughs> of all things, there's a foot pedal you can get for your iPad that will actually turn your pages for you. You can you don't have to reach up and you can actually tap your foot and it'll turn the page for you. <laughs> player who has his full Mac with a foot pedal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's amazing what you can do. Use those phones, especially if you're, if you're filling out a form, there's a flyer you want to keep. I'm, whenever I'm at the library, I'm always popping pictures of the various flyers there. I don't need to take it with me, but I want the information that I can share on my blog or something. Okay. Yes, ma'am? What's the question about front-facing, back-facing cameras? <laughs> is it doesn't matter which one. Front facing is basically just for you to take pictures of yourself or you in an environment or to do video conferencing. That's why they included the front facing camera is for video conferencing, whether it's via FaceTime or Skype or whatever. You want to be able to see you know, yourself and, and, and see them as well at the same time. So they had to add that camera. Yes? One of the biggest uses of the camera that I've seen in the past <coughs> is, is once a month I go to Valley College. Mm-hmm. And they have all these different job listings posted on the on the wall. Yes. Oh, and, yeah. and instead of you know going writing it all down, people just have their cell phone and just every job they're sitting, they just. Why would you sit there and try to write down? And I'll, I'll explain to you why using a camera is so much better than taking notes. I take lots of notes. I have in my bag back there my handy-dandy analog information gathering device. I have a Moleskine journal that I still use to this day for certain things. Taking notes in a meeting is one of them. If I want to grab information, though, the biggest way you can cause yourself trouble, every time you write something down, every time you rekey something into a computer, every time you 
move that data into some system, you have the chance of interjecting error, a mistype an email address, a mistyped phone number, a mistyped account number. Mm -hmm. If you can take a picture of it, you are guaranteed that you have accurately reflected what that information is. You haven't injected any errors yourself. Anyone will tell you, any data processing operation will tell you, the more times you rekey data, the worse it gets. Because we're human. We make mistakes. We're not machines. So if you have the opportunity to grab something exactly as it's presented to you, grab it. Because it'll be so much more accurate down the road. So it's a great idea of using that. Uh, I showed you some of my artistic pictures. There's also some, just again, to give you a little more things you can do with your device you maybe hadn't thought about. One of the apps I use is called Waterlog. And Waterlog allows me to take any of my photos. Actually, let's go to the photo library. Let's say here. And take the picture I took of you. And let's turn that into a watercolor drawing. <laughs> and it actually does, there's various presets that you can use to change it around. But it creates some wonderful results that you can share with family, friends, online, whatever. I actually put some of these, some of the things I do on cards. Um, but you can actually, you know, choose a different preset. Great little app. It's, it's a, a nice way of having some fun, artistic fun with your device. Make it feel a little less like technology, a little more like a, a kind of a partner in your creativity and your work. Please change them. It looks like I have mustache. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the water. Yeah, the, another one I use is called Tune Paint, and it, it is specifically does black and white, cartoon-like. Uh, let me see. What, there it is. Uh, cartoon-like oh, sketches okay. of your of your photos. Again, a little bit of fun, little little nice to play with. You're not yeah. sure what you might create. Gets the mind working too. I'm a big proponent of high tech and high touch. I think we need our technology, but we also need to get outdoors. I think we need to <laughs> yeah. use our camera, but we also need to go walking in the woods. And, and co any combination you can make. I often will take my computer out into my garden and work in my garden. That's a part of that. And so high-tech, high-tech is a great way of, of combining all these tools. And have a little fun with your system. Use it for something a little creative. It'll spur you to creativity in other aspects of your life. Don't be afraid of it. Can I see that picture? Can I take a picture of it? I'll send it to you if you like at the end. I can send you the, I can send you the, the picture. Okay. Um, the other thing you can do, and we'll see if we can demonstrate with this, uh, with the cables plugged in because of the projectors, so if it gets a little problematical, but um, all phones nowadays have a variety of modes that you can do. Now, one mode that I've been playing a lot, a lot with is the slow motion mode. Quite amazing the views you get of certain events with that. The one I wanted to show you today, though, was another one I use quite frequently, and that's the panorama. Oh, okay. <coughs> So if you're in an environment and you want to collect a more immersive picture of what that environment is like, oh, okay. you can take a panorama. This is a digital lamp for one of the little uh, fireworks events once. Mm -hmm. So then, if we look at that picture, there's the panorama. Oop, get back there. And we actually bring it full screen and we can kind of scroll around in it. Now, Honestly, that's a much more immersive picture than if it, the, the, the one I took oh, yeah. previously. You actually sort of feel you're, you're in the environment there. Yeah. And there are ways, there are other apps that will actually do complete 360s and put them in a little photo bubble. Like you can look up and look down and left and right and do all those other things. So you may find that there's opportunities for you. Uh, let's say you're in real estate. You want to take some pictures of a house. That's a much better way of taking a picture of a room in a house than a simple static picture, or you're showing off a garden, or you're showing off other things like that. Okay. So we talked again about information collection. Let's talk about reminders for a minute. Let's see if Siri can give us a little bit here. Remind me at three o'clock tomorrow to call David. Oh, that one worked right. Which David? Okay, and it actually will look at my contacts. You're not my contacts, but look in the contacts <laughs> and it's still listening to me, uh, and actually allow me to select the person I want. And so on. Oh. For tomorrow at 3 PM. Okay, I can okay, actually do this too. Let's see. Um, remind me to call my wife tomorrow at 3 p.m. Here's your reminder for tomorrow at 3 p.m. Okay, now. Shall I create it? Yes. You can actually create relationships in your contacts to say it knows who my wife is, it knows who my son is. So I can use those pronouns and it'll actually pick the right person automatically. Call my brother. Which brother? I'll call my brother Chris. Okay. Call, call my sister Donna. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or which what? <laughs> I, I am a I am a happily married man, but <laughs> one wife like is more than enough. Yes. <laughs> to do that on Google and 
Android. Mm -hmm. Uh, from what it looks like, you have to uh, download something called Now Cards in Google Launcher. Yeah, yeah. The Now Cards, and actually, if I go to Google on here real quick, this is the Google app on the iPhone. Remind me to call Roseanne <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah, again, the network connection. So there it is. So yeah, you probably need an, one more additional app. The Google Now is actually a system that Google uses. The Google Now Cards are a passive information system that <clears throat> if you look down here at the bottom, if I can get back to where I'm going, go back, please. If you look down here at the bottom, see it says 20 minute, 21 minutes to home? It actually knows where I'm at, and it's passively providing me information. It's going to take you about 21 minutes to get home from here right now. And I, I can click that. It'll come up and show me the route. And I can say, okay, I really don't need to get home right now, so I, mean, I, I can just swipe that away. Come on. Let's go. And of course, it's not going to swipe away, is it? Come on. Back up. <laughs> Google introduced a new piece of software the other day, and it has some bugs. It's causing the stall on my phone every so often. That's what's got me here. But basically, you can swipe away the cards. It'll say whose birthday is today. And it's a very kind of passive way of getting information. It just presents stuff that it thinks you might be interested in where you are at the moment you are. So that, that, that will help you there greatly. You can also do, for, for reminders, remind me to pick up milk when I get home. Yeah. <laughs> now, theoretically, it knows where, I, where my home is. Now, see the little thing that says arriving home? It knows where my home is, and it, my phone knows where I am. When I pull within a radius of my home, or in this case, I should have said the grocery store probably, but basically, I can say uh, when I arrive somewhere or when I leave somewhere. So when I leave here... Remind me to get milk. And as I pulled out of the parking lot, it would pop and say, hey, remember to get milk on your way home. Really? It's called lo those are location-based reminders. Uh, and you oh. can use them based on an actual address or, or a home, work, whatever. And it will remind you when you get into an area around that event. How do you do that? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, this time I did, sir. If you, if you do it manually, you can actually do it manually, too. Let me go to the reminders here real quick. Um, no, no. Yeah, I have the Android. Yeah, you can, you can, I believe it has uh, location-based reminders, too. Just give it a location. Oh. So I, if I went in here, I can say... Um, uh, well, it's yeah, it's uh, oh, Come here, go to the bottom of my list. You're seeing all my... <laughs> there's the event I just put in earlier, call my wife, see tomorrow at 3. <laughs> um if I put in here, uh, let's say test, and I click on the little eye, one of the things is, does remind me on a day or remind me at a location? And if I turn oh, that on, okay. so what I'm saying with Siri is it's, it's basically saying at a particular location. You can even okay. give it an address. Oh, okay. Now, do you already have 8.2 with the Google Watch, and will Google Watch make a dent in smartphones? Apple Watch. Apple Watch. Apple Watch. Uh, I don't have an Apple Watch. Yeah. Apple. No, Apple. No, no, nobody's well. Yeah, yeah. yeah Apple. Do you, do you see that impacting... <clears throat> Um, or do you think that we're, we're good to stick with our, our phones? I think right now we're good to stick with the phones. Uh, basically, the Apple Watch is a wrist interface to your phone. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a little bit of computing power itself, but basically it's, it's, it's a secondary display for your wrist. Uh, there's some interesting devices about ta the tapping in knowledge, which you, uh, it, it will, uh, instead of making a noise, you'll, if my phone were turned on normally, you'd hear it making all sorts of bleeps and bloops. I've got it turned off on Do Not Disturb right now. Uh, but uh, the, the concept of tapping you on the wrist or vibrating on your wrist to remind you of something or to show you when you have an alert. To train you to remember to remember. Well, it's, it's you know, surprising when you get reminded you need milk. When you're at home in your easy chair going, I don't have milk for breakfast in the morning. How m that happens to me all the time. It'd be really nice if I set a reminder to get it on the way home, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. Does it repeat? Because um, it, it said, here's your reminder for free, but it didn't say... That is a setting. You can ask it to repeat the reminders. Oh, there is a setting yeah. for that? Yeah. Uh, okay. And there's various... There's also timers and stuff using the various clock. You can just say, set a timer for 30 minutes snooze and, alarm. and snooze alarms. I, I woke up this morning to my phone. You know, I set an alarm, and it woke me up. And that's, that's again, just one of those features that it has that why not make use of it? Did you set the alarm with Siri? Or? You can, yeah. You can say, set an alarm for 1 o'clock today. I've set an alarm for 1 p.m. Okay. Uh, okay. Hey, Siri, set a timer for 30 seconds. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for 30 seconds. Okay. 
I always feel like I'm giving a bad demonstration of Siri when when I'm on the, the in bad cell areas because it, it does tend to not work as well as it should. And which provider do you have? Set a timer for thirty seconds. AT and T. It's a. It happens to be. We're about two bars here, and it's going in and out too because it, it works sometimes and others. But you can do various things like that. You can go ahead and set up. Well, this is thing. a state, you know, a city facility. So in. Uh, it's a buildings too. Oftentimes, buildings. oftentimes with the buildings, metal frame buildings, yeah. it really cuts down on it. I'm sorry, yes. It's probably the most expensive AT and T the server the service. Uh, yeah. I'm. I have been with AT and T when it was up from when it was yeah. LA Cellular. <laughs> so. I'm I'm suffering inertia. I've never moved off AT and T. They bought the services that I was that I was using Went from LA Cellular to AT and T Wireless, which really wasn't AT and T. Back to AT and T. So uh, the, one of the reasons I stick with AT and T for my phone is I still have a grandfathered data plan. I pay a little more for it, but it's unlimited. I don't I don't get nickel and dime for my data, and I use a lot of data, so and so I've never really moved. What's the controversy between Verizon and AT and T? Because I've been shopping, and I'm going to go shopping, but I've been having these conversations about. Verizon having this monopoly on the towers everywhere. Well, they're all monopolies, honestly. Depending where you where you live, you know, you're, you're, it, the best thing to look is at your coverage maps for your areas where you work and where you live. Mm -hmm. Yes. I uh, I don't have very favorable things to say about Verizon because what would happen? I had a, a unlimited mm -hmm. and it was grandfathered in. They were trying to push me to yes. to, to convert over to like two gigabytes. But they did. They, they literally would slow the, the data flow down, and I had a lot of difficulty. I finally just stopped using them. Went to the T-Mobile, and I have great access because T-Mobile has unlimited um, uh, phone, you know, uh, for family plan. My son and I, and I'm paying like literally half of what I was paying with Verizon, yeah. and I still have the access. And yeah. so it depends on the coverage area you want to be in for LA or for this area. T-Mobile works just fine for me. Yeah. Uh, you will hear nasty things about every cell service, every cable service on planet. Someone will have a horrible experience and someone will have a decent experience with it. Yeah. It's really hard to decide. Uh, the fact is we need more competition in general, and that would help us all out because they would simply have to compete a little more between themselves. <coughs> um, I realize our time is running out quickly, so I'm going to, I'm going to b uh, move forward to some of the stuff here. Um, I'm allowed to go over. I don't yeah, want to take up your time. You have committee meetings to do. Oh, yeah, uh, so much fun. Okay, so, uh, so I talked about the camera, gathering data with the camera. Well, you, you might actually gather textual data and, and other things like that, too, and web pages and stuff like that. One of the greatest apps for that is called Evernote. Evernote is available on, yeah, Evernote's available on your phone, your computer, via a web browser, via any computer you might be on, so, uh, tablets, whatever. That's the great thing about it is you can access your collection, your notebooks, wherever you might be. I use it to collect up uh, web pages a lot and ideas that I want to perhaps reblog about. And there's even a recipe there that I have in here. Um, there are plugins you get for your browser. So if you see a web page you want and you want to keep that forever like a recipe in case it uh -huh. happens to disappear, click the Evernote button. It slurps the entire page whoop, right down into your Evernote. You can search on it. An interesting feature that Evernote provides is even if I've taken a picture of a flyer, Normally, we could not search on the text in that flyer. It's a picture, not text. It's very hard to search pictures. Evernote has a feature where it'll actually do a form of OCR, optical character recognition, mm -hmm. on that picture. It'll attempt to find the words in that picture so that when you search on things, it says, you know what? It doesn't do a direct conversion of that text. It says, this picture looks like it has the word you're looking for and we'll actually be able to pull some data out of pictures. It'll also take audio notes. Um, it allows you to basically organize your data however you wish. We all have different filing systems. I don't understand my wife's and she does not understand mine. Uh, but Evernote is, is flexible enough that you can basically impose whatever system of organization you want upon it. It just acts as the repository for this information. You can, yes, it's an app. It's also a website. And it's uh, it's a, a uh, you can actually Evernote. Evernote, yeah. If I if I run it again, you might see the title come. Well, no, of course not. Of course, I wouldn't want to do that, would it? Uh, you can read it there on the bottom. It's an elephant, huh? It's an el an elephant never forgets, right? What a perfect logo for their site. I, I've got <laughs> Evernote. That's one of the, again with a brand new computer that I'm I'm learning about. I forget. I think it's the was it OneNote. The OneNote is is a is similar thing from Microsoft. Which, which is better? I've got both. I haven't read. I haven't sucked in. I don't yet. use OneNote, so I could not say. Okay. Uh, again, whatever works best for you. I tend to try to be somewhat agnostic about my choices in technology. Uh, it's whatever works best 
right now for me. Does I'm a Mac user. Um, interoperability with Excel spreadsheets and, and Word mm -hmm. documents, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, anything Microsoft does is going to tie into their other products. So mm -hmm. if you're a heavy Microsoft user, like I'm a heavy Google user, mm -hmm. so things that tie in with Google I tend to lean towards. But if you're a heavy Microsoft user, yeah, you'll, you'll be leaning more in that direction okay. for sure. Yes? Uh, as far as compatibility with the uh, Microsoft document formats, there's a, a free app called uh, KingSoft Office, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's free. I'm using it right this minute. Yeah. Yeah. I actually use, again, since I'm a Google user, I've moved away from using Microsoft products. I was raised in the days of WordStar and WordPerfect, and then, of course, to Word and Excel, and, you know, actually, WordPerfect, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and Symfony. Yeah. <laughs> How many members remember the way back in the day? Uh, I actually moved off of Microsoft products. They were frustrating to support and frustrating to use for me. So as a personal choice, I decided, eh, if I don't have to use them, I won't. And what I did is I actually switched over to using Google Docs and Google Apps for nearly everything that I do. One of the big reasons for that is something that Microsoft is addressing now with their Office 365 product, interoperability and sharing. Mm -hmm. I could write an article in Google Docs. My wife could actually watch me type it into my computer if she wished. She can edit that for me, which she does. She doesn't have to send me. Well, there's no sending a document, so we're looking at the same document. We can edit the same document. I've actually even used it for live brainstorming sessions where we had people scattered all over the Southern California area. We're all in one document, basically having a meeting in a document in real time. Well, we used extensively at Bank of America. It was SharePoint and Discovery. Yep, that's the Microsoft side. So here's here's an example. Here's my notes for today's talk. Gosh, I wish internet was better. <laughs> Never failed. Um, I can edit it on my phone. I can edit it on a computer. I can edit it on someone else's computer if I log in. I've actually, um, even though I'm a Mac user for most of my stuff, I needed to replace my laptop, and I decided I did not need to spend $1,200 on a laptop. I actually got a Chromebook, which is in my bag in the back. It's basically a Google laptop. Yeah. It runs the Chrome OS. Everything's done in the Chrome browser, where I spend all my time anyway. And it's actually working very well for me uh, because it ties into all these services. Yes? How heavy and big it is? I don't know it's so small. Pardon? Oh, it's a 13-inch. It's, a, 13 inch. Oh, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a standard size laptop. I need a full-size keyboard, so I'm limited. I, I don't, and I need, with these, I need a bigger screen. So I tend to go with the, between 13 and 15-inch. Actually, I think that might even be a 15. Oh, but it's heavy, yeah. No, it's very light because there's no moving hard drive. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I can show it to you at the end if you like. So Google Docs for document sharing, real-time brainstorming. I use it now to do my slides. I don't use PowerPoint anymore. Uh, I do all my slides in slides in Google. And then I can actually save it to this device. So even if I'm not on the internet, if I was giving a, a slide-based presentation, I don't have to worry about my internet connection. It's local to the phone, just like it would be on a laptop. Uh, we can use a phone, the iPad, my computer, my Chromebook, whatever, to present it. And it's, uh, again, that's because I tend to be a Google user, and so those services have worked really well for me. What about uh, extra storage? As I know, I'm running up against my limits that i got to put in a... I've been pretty lucky with storage, actually. Uh, and by the way, if you are a Google user, they're doing a thing right now. If you want to run their little security check on your Google account, they'll give you a free two gigabytes additional to your account. So I just got my notice that they had added it to mine. Because I bought the Chromebook, I actually get a terabyte of free storage with the Chromebook. So Well, also, wow. with, the, with the iPhone, a lot of your photos is what's mostly on mine. Those get bumped, sucked up into the cloud. And These all get plugged into my Mac and slurped over to Mac into my photo, so I have my whole collection there, yeah. Um, so that's Google Docs. Uh, they have a variety of, of products. Docs is word processing. Sheets is spreadsheets. Uh, slides is a PowerPoint presentation style. Um, one of the things that I always demonstrate at a talk like this, because you never know when it might become useful to you, is Google Translate. Um, because this, to me, is what Arthur C. Clarke was, uh, was talking about when he said, um, I would like some coffee, please. Vorrei un caffè, per favore. I can even, I can even hold it up to someone. Oh, yeah. I can even hold it up to someone. Oh, oh okay, I said that. Back to where I was. I'd like some coffee, please. Can I hold it up? There you go. It'll even, if you wanted just to show it to the person. My wife's family is Sicilian, so we visited there several times, so I use this to practice my Italian. And when I get particularly stuck on a phrase, <laughs> I can use it as well. And I actually have sat around with the family and used it when there was something I just couldn't translate in my head. I would actually translate What's it with the this. App is that Google Translate. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to use it sparingly because. 
I've had people like because I speak Spanish and they sent me these documents they translate in Google Trans and I'm like this is not even Spanish. It is it is machine <laughs> translation. I would say for <laughs> phrases you're probably okay. It gets the point across. For documents, no, this is not a this is not a replacement for a real translator. Yeah, okay, don't. Again, you have to be smarter than your GPS. You've got to be smarter than your translation engine. I am the very model of a modern major general. I do the vegetable. Animal or mineral. I will. That said, though, I was once. I was having a live video conference. I just decided to. Uh, sometimes I do a kind of career office hours for people, and I just go online, and anyone who wants to join me can join me. And a gentleman from Brazil joined me. Well. I don't speak Portuguese, and he did not speak English. So what we started doing is using our phones to translate back and forth uh, what we were saying to each other, and it actually worked. Google Plus Plus. I was really surprised. It actually was quite amazing that we're getting the tools nowadays that can help push us beyond that language barrier that we all face. Yeah. Even here in Los Angeles. How many languages are spoken here in Los Angeles? Have yes. you ever used Babelfish? Uh, back in the day, back in the day, yes. Um, the other feature this has, and I, I don't know if I have, um, let's see if I can do it the other way around. There was a program called Word Lens um, that Google bought and integrated into Google Translate. And what it's doing here, it's actually looking at my document in English and translating it in real time to Italian in this case. So I can hold it up to a sign, I can hold it up to uh, a document like this, anything, and it will attempt in real time to translate that sign or that document into the language I wish. Which if you want to see, let's see if I can get really weird with you here, because my heritage by my name, although I don't have much of a connection to it, is, with my last name you might imagine, is Welsh. Um, you can actually <laughs> convert to Welsh. So that's I asked for a cup of coffee in Welsh. And no, I cannot pronounce it because I do not speak the language. We visited oh, there. On, we visited there once. No, what's funny is the letter forms, like the double F is actually a D, and the double Ds are actually Fs. And so oh, really? it, it, they don't use the same, the, it's not the same phonetic alphabet. And so it's very difficult in that regard. But, uh, you know. <laughs> yes, he has to use a, a, he's not using a real voice, he's using the electronic voice for that. Yeah, unlike the Italian, which was pretty much a much better. Speaking much too slowly for an Italian. Speaking much too slowly for an Italian. There would be what? My favorite phrase in Italy when we visit is "parlo lentamente por favore." Speak slower, please. Um, so that is Arthur C. Clarke said: "Any technology significantly advanced takes on the appearance of magic. That is magic." <laughs> okay, I show that to anyone, and they're like, "Huh? You can do what?" That is that is a great example of the power that's being built into these little handheld devices now. It really is quite amazing. Now I saw the iPad magician on some show a couple of days ago. So yeah. Yeah. now oh, I yeah. know what he's yeah. been up to. Uh, your your devices can also be a great learning tool. Uh, one of the great things books still exist. Oh, yeah. I know. People oh, yeah. say books don't oh, yeah. exist. No, books still exist. Oh, yeah. I read paper books too, but I have how many different readers on my phone? Okay. Kindle. I can read any Kindle book I wish on my phone or on my computer. I can read iBooks, Apple iBooks service. Feedly is a collection of uh, f feeds from websites, hundreds of websites that I read. That's my magazine reading. I don't flip to paper magazines anymore. I go to my Feedly, and these are all sites that I have at some point said I want to. I'm interested in what they talk about, so I want to see it, and I just flip through it when I'm doing nothing else. That's my reading. Feedly. Another one is Flipbook, Flipboard. Yeah which is a great one as well, allows you to add variety of, and it presents a more magazine-like interface. Um, please show it. it <laughs> First one is called Feedly, F-E-E-D-L-Y, uh, and the other one's called Flipboard. And I wish it would come up, but it looks like it's gonna be problematical, unfortunately. Um, they allow you to very easily browse information that you said, I'm interested in gardening. Well, here's some gardening sites and gardening blogs and stuff that you might be interested in. You can simply flip through them in a very visual manner. Um, there you go. So, so I'm trying to load the picture. Um, but I can, I can flip through, and these, these, the, where you're seeing the clocks would be actually pictures in this, but 10 times. So, so that's from the so story from the Telegraph. Recipes. I have a lot of different interests, so there'll be technology, there'll be food, there'll be books, space photos. 
all sorts of things. That's how I do my reading, magazine style reading these days, is through these applications. If I wanted to read an actual application, I can go get a magazine out of the library. The LA Public Library has a collection of magazines that you, I know, leave me alone, <laughs> it's not gonna run. I can actually, uh, through the library, get a variety of magazines like Smithsonian, and Mental Floss, and Good Housekeeping, and Martha Stewart Living, and Rachel Ray's cookbook, you know, cookbook magazine, all free through the library, directly downloaded to my device, where I can flip through it much like you would on a magazine. I can do it on my computer, on my phone, on my iPad, on my Kindle tablet, wherever, wherever I want to do that. Totally for free, it's part of the money that I give to support our libraries. Okay, you can download tons of books from the library as ebooks, either ebooks or audiobooks. Search a library, and when you see a thing that says download, that means that that book is available for you to either download it as an ebook to read or download it as an audiobook. And you have to kind of look, it'll say sound, it'll say ebook. You have to, a you have, to have a library card. Really? Yep. Then you get then then you get one of the apps. Some books they can send to your Kindle player, so they're just Kindle books. Others they use this OverDrive software, especially for the audiobooks. Again, you set up a free account with them, and away you go. You just you have the books right there on your device, and your reading progress is tracked between all your devices. So I can start reading on my Kindle, be in the car, it'll forward me on my phone to where I was reading on my Kindle. I'll read on my phone, it'll tell the Kindle, okay, he's read this far, and the Kindle, I can set up my computer and it'll all sync up. So I, I, it's like I have a permanent bookmark in that book. Yes? I have a Nook. Mm -hmm. Will it work for a Nook? Some will, some won't. The Nook is not as highly supported, unfortunately. There are systems whereby you can actually plug the Nook in to your computer, you can download the book to your computer and then push it into the Nook. That's typically what happens with that. It's called an EPUB document. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah. And if you get an EPUB, you should be able to download it to your computer and then shove it into the Nook, where the Kindles will often be delivered directly to the Kindle. Wow. Yeah. The Nook, unfortunately, isn't quite as well supported. Although I was at my local library the other day, and now you can actually check out from the library a Nook filled with 45 to 50 children's books that you can take home and read with your child. Wow. You don't have to take a stack of books home like this. You take the Nook home, and they're all on the Nook. Okay. I think it's a great program. I think it's a great way of introducing kids to a concept that you can have accessibility to all these books. I mean, again, I read paper books too. I have paper books in my bag right now. I, I, I don't, I'm very agnostic where I read. Sometimes it's just simply more convenient to read it on, uh, on my devices. <clears throat> I get a lot of books free for review. And now review books, rather than send out paper copies of review books, they send you an e-book. I can read the book. I can review it. Done. Easy peasy. Why, buy, why worry about sending, spend, sending money, sending pieces of paper around the world if you don't have to? Yeah. And frankly, all textbooks should be electronic. Anyone who's carried around the Globe Shakespeare in their backpack for a semester in college <laughs> knows the experience of not having an e-book. Okay? Yes? Well, that's, that's going to be a tremendous change when, when textbooks go fully, mm -hmm. you know, fully mm -hmm. e because My it's son, such an industry. You know, yeah. My son has, I believe he's using two books right now for his high school that, that we got on his Kindle. He has a little Kindle Touch, and those two books, at least, are those two are on a, a device, so he doesn't have to carry those books around. So you're not lugging around War and Peace. <laughs> exactly. The, the Globe Shakespeare, by the way, is the, the collected works of Shakespeare. It is this thick, and it's printed about this big, and he carried it around for 13 weeks in college. Yes, ma'am. My son's uh, working on his uh, uh, computer science bachelor's degree and uh, mm -hmm. all of his homework and all of his assignments are... Uh, My son, even in high school, gets a lot of his homework that, electronically. They download all the uh, text. I mean, so nothing is... He's not loaded. He's not carrying around these big textbooks. He's, everything's on the patch. Another great, another couple of great learning aspects too are podcasts. How many people know what a podcast is? Yeah, I mean, trying to get a job doing some of that. Yeah, kind of NPR. I've been, a, I'm a pioneer podcaster. I was one of the first 20 podcasters wow. when the term was coined because I was writing my career column, so I had content and I knew how to do audio, and so I was very easy to, to. Within the first two weeks, I jumped right in and started doing. I did the show for 10 years. I recently just finished that podcast, but I still do other podcasts on gardening and other things. Um, and call coming in. No. <laughs> Can't wait. Um, the podcast app on the phone, the podcast app on iTunes on your computer, whether it's Windows or Mac, doesn't matter. There are a host 
of great podcasts out there. Now, some of the podcasts I listen to are actually traditional radio shows. The BBC Radio 4 shows, In Our Time and Thinking Loud, are excellent. In Our Time, three experts, Melvin Bragg, sit down, talk about a topic for 45 minutes. It's, it's a little miniature 45-minute master class in some of the most esoteric things you might ever have wanted to learn about. Uh, I was listening today on a way over here, I was listening to this show about Ashoka the Great, an Indian ruler uh, back in the... BCs. I, I don't actually remember what, what they threw off the top of my head. Um, thing on Thucydides, early Chinese history, uh, physiocrats, queens and up. It just they 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 range all over the place. A thing on comets. Uh, Thinking Aloud is a uh, show. It's a show based on sociological research, sociologists, and so it's split into two halves. And just again, variety of research being done about the urban poor. Uh, a lot of career-based stuff gets discussed there. About uh, uh, both based out of England, but the topics they talk about are still very much appropriate to what you, what we need here today. Yes. Where do you find the podcast? I and mean, I have no idea what I'm interested in, but how would I browse? In the podcast app or in the I, in iTunes on your computer, uh, and actually just doing a search on the topic you're interested in and the word podcast, because you can listen to them directly from a web browser. You don't have to have a podcast client. Just search this and a podcast, and you'll get a list of podcasts on that topic. If you were to type career podcast, you'd see career opportunities that I do. If you see gardening podcasts, you'd probably see a gardener's notebook that I do. Um, you can also type that kind of stuff into YouTube saying whatever you know, podcast on whatever subject and up and pop like 15 different yeah. uh, choices of that particular thing. I've done that before myself. But the podcast clients will also have a directory. There's the iTunes podcast directory that you can do a search in there as well, either by words or by category. You can go through their category listings. I was going more for... I don't know what I'm interested in. Just Go to iTunes and actually look at the podcast directory. They always have a wide variety of featured podcasts there that might introduce you to something you're interested in. People often say, you brought up the YouTube word. People say, YouTube, not the cat videos. YouTube is one of the foremost educational sources you will ever find today. Until okay. until I really started looking into it, I thought it was just a bunch of granny shooting a shotgun off and, and you know, hokey finoki kind of stuff there, but... They've had things on music mixing. They've had things on, on basic stuff with Pro Tools and everything else. You can, I, as I like to say, I, I went to the University of YouTube. Yep. Uh, I, call, I, I have a playlist on my YouTube called My Own Personal Master's Degree. And the shows that I really like and the, the videos that I really like that are very educational, that's, I, I didn't get my master's. My wife went back and got her master's later in life and her PhD now. She's a college professor. I didn't want to go back into the educational system, but I'm an autodidact. I love learning, and I teach myself lots of things. YouTube is one of those sources. Uh, I have my channel on YouTube, which, by the way, you can see talks like this and the talk I gave to open uh, two weeks ago on transition as the new normal, as well as talks reaching, ranging back several years, 10 years probably or more, on my YouTube channel. There's also gardening on, YouTube, on my YouTube channel because I also do a gardening blog. YouTube is phenomenal. A month ago, my lawnmower wasn't working. So I yes. went on YouTube and just searched on what my problem was, <coughs> and I got a whole list of different YouTubes and how to fix it. Yeah. I mean, you all heard of crowdsourcing. Well, imagine crowdsourcing your brain. That's what you're doing with YouTube and the web and all these other sources. Is, uh, as a high-tech consultant, if I experienced a problem that I had not run into before, the first thing I would do was search on that problem and say, who else has experienced it? Well, back when I started in computers, I had maybe three people I could ask, okay? And then maybe when bulletin boards came out, which you had to dial up, I maybe had 50 people I could ask that question to. Now I have millions, billions of people that I can put that question out to and say, who else has run into this? And oftentimes they don't have the exact same problem, but they'll have a problem that's similar enough that it leads me to the solution for the problem that I had. Well, also one interesting that, uh, that I've used it for on a couple of occasions is I have a particular skill, and I want to see is there how are other people who supposedly call themselves professionals how are they doing it? In some cases, I found out they're doing it the Rube Goldberg method, whereas I'm doing it the uh, cut you know cut all this baloney out of it there. And wow, I actually have a simpler way of doing it. This person is supposed to be professional doing it. You know, Sometimes so. we all have our biases and our methods of doing things. And the fact is, you know, it pays to have this whole world that you can reach out to these days through your devices and learn something that you, you, you need to know right now. There's a thing called learning on demand, right? Yeah. That's what YouTube is. It's learning on demand. I have a need for that issue, that thing right now. Uh, of course, you're not going to play, are you? Oh, well. Um, 
Google search on this, uh, any search engine, by the way, is just a, a further extrapolation of this concept. Go to Google and say, I'm interested in gardening podcasts. Boom. And start your search there. It'll lead you to one to the other and so on and so forth. And, and you'll find, uh, probably in most cases, unless it's something very esoteric, you'll find exactly what you're looking for. It may take a little searching, but the information is out there, and I highly recommend you use these as a learning device, which they are. Um, Again, another thing we don't deal a lot with here in Los Angeles up to certain times of year, but weather. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Right now, I mean, actually, we do, the thing we're dealing with weather, what happened to the LA Marathon this Sunday? Moved up a half hour. They moved up a half hour because it's going to be hotter than Hades out there. And so they decided they needed to do that. Simple built in weather app from Apple. Okay? I can put in various, I don't know why it came in, but you know, various areas of my life. I actually have, let me see here, not New York, but Los Angeles. Because Los Angeles and Van Nuys, different temp, different weather. Uh, yeah. Actually, in here I don't have the, uh, I'll show it to you in this other app. But uh, when it is rainy season, when we're having thunderstorms and various things, uh, Wonder Map is an excellent source. It's real-time radar uh, and weather stations. These are weather stations that people can have in their own backyards that are connected to Internet. So some are at colleges. My closest one is at Valley College. It's run by them. Pierce has a great one. Pierce has yeah. one as well. And I can say, I can actually watch the weather roll in when these thunderstorms roll in. I can actually watch it when I can actually predict when it's going to arrive. Yeah. They have some. Uh, pardon? Yes, they have. On occasion. We just had one a couple weeks ago. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Uh, but you can, animate, you can animate the radar map as well. Where were you? Now, something. My parents still live back in my hometown of New London, Ohio, north central Ohio. Well, as you know, the East Coast has had a. Horrible winter. Oh, God. Well, they've had it. And, Eastern. and we have regular thunderstorms and tornado warnings in New London. Oh, so really? I like to remain connected to what's going on with my parents. I actually own their house, so it's actually a piece of property that I would not like to be blown away as well. <laughs> um, this weather radio, how many people remember the old Radio Shack weather radios, little right. cubes you sent to us? Weep, 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 weep. What, tornado warning in your area. But, oh, yeah. Okay, weather radio does that on your phone. I have uh, alerts set up for here in Los Angeles, which sometimes we do get flood alerts. Uh, there was the El Nino year we got. It, yeah. This thing was going off every five minutes. I often get warnings, winter storm warning effect, blizzard warning in effect, tornado warning in effect, and I can actually bring up radar and see what's going on. It just keeps me passively involved with scuffing, you know, 2,000 miles on the other side of the country. In a passive, what I mean by passive is it, it pops up when it has something to tell me, and it actually <coughs> says it. It'll play audio, beep, just like you hear the old weather alerts on TV, beep, beep, beep. Uh, the weather announce alert has been announced in your area. Yeah, flash flood alert, exactly. Um, and I've actually enjoyed that app. I think that app might be pay. I think I got it when it was free, but that one is probably one of the f few pay apps that I have. And forecast is, a, I'm, a, I'm a geek in all things. Uh, that's the way I describe it. I geek out on gardening and, and technology and weather and beekeeping and brewing and all, all these things. Uh, forecast. We'll see if it comes up. Forecast is a great app. It really gives you a geeky view. It, it does minute by minute. It'll actually have a bar graph that says rain is approaching. It's going to start raining in your area at 10 o'clock and go light scattered rain until 11. And then it actually will give you graphs and bars and charts and all this great stuff. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great little app for that. Uh, I will have a list in these apps. I'll make sure I send out with the video. Um, yeah, these... Uh this year we've actually had weather for the first time in a while. Yeah, it's been. It's, I wish we had more rain, but we yeah. did get some. Finally, big focus these days on health, oh, yeah. me included. Uh, I recently lost about sixty pounds. I had wow. my, my well, to to say <laughs> thank you, thank you. I wish I could take full credit for when my gallbladder tried to kill me two years ago, and that that started the the, well, the, the weight loss. Um, there are lots of great health apps out there. Apple in their iPhone six and future iPhones have integrated a lot of uh, accelerometers and other health gathering information in the phone. So just carrying this phone around, it knows how many steps I've taken during my day. It can chart my weight and various things. I actually use a service called MyPlate. Uh, I use it to track my calorie intake. Uh, it'll also now, I, I don't have it set up, it'll actually track my exercise. It'll, since my phone knows how far I've, how many steps I've taken, it will actually give me a, cal a calorie calculation of how many calories I've burned in my daily food diary, which is great. Uh, it allows me to, that you can set up various foods that are already pre-decided, like there's, you know, lactose-free coffee came from, from Ralph's, okay, I know it's 10 calories a these, but okay, I can put that in in the morning when I have my coffee, Be medium bananas. Anything I use on a regular basis starts to float to the top, so it's very easy to select, 
And basically, I'm trying to lose two pounds a week again. I actually gained some weight back, so I'm actually back on kind of a true diet. Uh, I'm a fussy eater, so I can't really just take out whole classes of food, but I have to watch my calories, and so that's what my plate does for me. It, it says, today I have 1,667 calories I can consume. How I consume them is my own lookout, uh, but that's what I should stick to if I want to try and lose two pounds a week. Okay? So that's a great service.